behind Bob Crane's murder still haunts family and friends. During my career, I've had a lot of big cases, but the Bob Crane case tops them all. It's one of those cases that, uh, of all the murder cases in the valley, this is the one that keeps coming back. This Crane case seems to have taken on a life of its own. For five decades, Bob Crane has been a constant presence in our lives. The wisecracking Colonel Hogan adored by millions. And his unsolved murder continues to fascinate. I've read about all this stuff. It's weird to finally touch it. The physical evidence in the case still preserved in these 11 boxes in the Maricopa County Attorney's Office. It's like opening a time capsule. Bob Crane's fingerprints taken in the morgue, his TWA luggage tag, and the keys to his Scottsdale apartment. Bob Crane's blood. It is. Taken at his autopsy. It was on June 30th, 1978. Still in liquid form. Yeah, it appears to be, yes it is. Okay, so this stuff basically hasn't been touched or seen in 20 years, right? No, it hasn't. Are we even fortunate this exists? Yes. This memo from November of 2002 ordered that the evidence be destroyed. Can you explain why it wasn't destroyed? No. So we lucked out. We did. Back then, you needed a huge amount of blood and you know sample to be able to determine DNA. Now it takes so little with the new sciences, we may be able to really, you know, uh, figure this thing out. We will retest the DNA contained in these vials and try to unlock the mystery of who killed Bob Crane. What will this evidence tell us? As a prosecutor, I'm not afraid of the truth. We will send the DNA to one of the top labs in the nation. In June of 1978, Bob Crane was performing in dinner theaters across the country, still riding the popularity of Hogan's heroes. But privately, Crane was obsessed with a lurid hobby that consumed him, videotaping his many sexual encounters with women. This all-American image of him, of my dad as Colonel Hogan, has the dark side. Colonel Hogan isn't who we thought he was. John Carpenter, a home video salesman from Los Angeles, met Crane on the set of Hogan's and introduced him to this new technology. Carpenter liked um, being in the limelight. He liked the, the benefit of um, having women that he would never have the opportunity to get a hanger on. Carpenter often met up with Crane out on the road. The two would pick up women and videotape their sexual exploits. It became kind of a, a hobby that went too far. I think their friendship really revolved around uh, electronics and women. In June of 1978, Crane was performing in beginner's luck at the Windmill Dinner Theater in Scottsdale. Carpenter met up with him, but instead of staying with Crane as he had in the past, Crane booked him in a hotel room down the street. Towards the end of my dad's life, he was definitely pulling away from John Carpenter. Weeks before his death, Crane told his son, he was tired of Carpenter hanging around. John Carpenter's a pain in the ass, I'm making changes. Police believe Crane was severing his relationship with Carpenter, and Carpenter was angry. Crane was reflecting on his life, as heard in this final interview with Cool Radio six days before his murder. But uh, I have no regrets on any, in any of my life at this point. No. You can't look backwards. No. no, and the terrible thing is I'll be 50 in two weeks. I want to go out swinging, as they say. Bob Crane never made it to his 50th birthday. In the early morning hours of June 29th, 1978, while Bob Crane was asleep inside the Winfield Apartments, someone entered his bedroom and bludgeoned him to death. This never before seen video taken by Scottsdale police inside Crane's apartment as a medical examiner shaves Crane's battered head for a closer look at the fatal wound. Well, we got two blows here. There are very definitely two blows on this. An electrical cord cut from a video camera was found tied around Crane's neck. There was no sign of forced entry. My theory is that Crane let him in the apartment. There was no sign of a struggle. Suspicions quickly turned to John Carpenter. You have the right to the presence of an attorney. Do you understand these rights? I understand the rights the way you read them. John Carpenter's first interview with police never before heard by the public. My question to you is that prior to an agreement on these rights here, what I was under the impression, correct me if I'm wrong before I make my statement to you, that I was coming here to help you out, not put me in. <laughs> 
and I'm really very apprehensive about this. The morning of the murder, Carpenter flew back to L.A. The plan was for Bob Crane to drive him to the airport, as clearly noted in Crane's blood-spattered day planner by his bedside. John leaves, 10 a.m. Instead, Carpenter took a cab. Why the sudden change in plans? He even laid out items he planned to give Carpenter that morning. Carpenter's swim trunks, unclaimed, still in evidence. At the time Crane's body was discovered, before the outside world knew he was dead, John Carpenter made several suspicious phone calls back to Scottsdale. And he called the Windmill Dinner Theater at a time where he knew Crane wouldn't even be there. It was very unusual for Carpenter to start calling around town looking for Crane and asking people if they had seen him. He even called Bob Crane's son. I'm back in town. Uh, uh, let me know if you need uh, anything. And uh, we're on the phone for 30 seconds. I hang up. I do one of those, you know, where you almost look at the phone. What, why did he just call me? The trip's over. Why would he call me? Highly unusual. Highly unusual. Suspicious. Suspicious. Carpenter called Bob Crane's apartment twice. A detective answered. This in your mind is a classic of a guilty person returning to the crime scene. Telephonic. Absolutely. Carpenter never asked why police were in Crane's apartment because police say he knew the answer. Next, John Carpenter becomes the main suspect when blood is discovered in his rental car. How did that blood sample get on Carpenter's door? If it's not my dad's blood, naturally, who is it? How did it get there? 38 years later, can DNA science finally identify who killed Bob Crane?